Good morning, everybody. It's a great day in Connecticut, and I am Sally Whipple, and I'd like to welcome you to Connecticut's Old State House for a conversation at noon. This is a monthly series of programs that um, we bring to you uh, in collaboration with our friends at Connecticut Humanities who generously support these programs. Our monthly conversations usually begin with a look at Connecticut's histories through the eyes of a historian and then move into a panel discussion that blends history with current issues and insights. Today we are very pleased to have a program that not only celebrates and shares new scholarship, but celebrates and shares new scholars. The people who will be talking today, along with Dr. Um, Matthew Warshower, are students um, from CCSU who have done original research on Civil War topics, and they're going to present them and discuss them today. And we're very pleased to have this opportunity to share their work with you, because it's wonderful work. Diane Smith, the Connecticut Network Senior Producer for Program Development, is going to engage our guests in a wonderful conversation and allow you to make comments and ask questions as well. So welcome to Connecticut's Old State House, and please enjoy the program. Thank you all for being here today, and I hope you will have some questions and comments. We'll have somebody roaming the audience uh, with a microphone because we are taping this for CTN. So if you wouldn't mind waiting for the mic to get to you before you make your comments, that would really be terrific for our production. So even 150 years later, it seems that there is no event in American history that generates as much debate as the Civil War. How have perceptions of the war changed over time? Do we view it differently than we did 50 years ago? Does our location in the country change our perception? Those are just a few of the issues that we want to explore today as we consider the new book, Inside Connecticut and the Civil War, Essays on One State's Struggle, written by graduate students at Connecticut Central State University and edited by Professor Matthew Warshower. Inside Connecticut in the Civil War is a landmark study. It is the first book written wholly by graduate students at CCSU, and it represents the newest, most groundbreaking research on Connecticut's war experiences. Dr. Warshower not only led the effort to get this book published, he also is leading the remembrance and study of the Civil War in our state by serving as the co-chair of the Connecticut Civil War Commemoration Commission. The commission has been more active than any other state in New England and perhaps the entirety of the North, offering a wide array of programs, symposia, book talks, historical reenactments, school collaborations, and more. The commission has inspired dozens upon dozens of local community historical societies and museums to develop their own programming. So this is just one of those programs. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Matthew Warshower. Thank you very much for coming. And I'll, I'll begin with this. I do promise the Civil War commemoration will be ending. <laughs> At some point it will be ending. We will not make the commemoration longer than the actual war. But in saying that, uh, we are focusing on this history. And I think the way that Diane framed this uh, is exactly right. And that is, it is uh, the subject is one that is controversial. Uh, it is one that we have uh, looked at and looked at in very different ways over the years. And one of the driving forces of our commemoration of the sesquicentennial, 150 years, has been to ask really a quite simple question. And that is, what will those 50 years from now say and think about what we did now at this 150th anniversary? What have we done? And our, our focus has not been a celebration of Connecticut's involvement in the Civil War, because I, for one, don't believe that we should be celebrating war, but we are commemorating war. And that is a quite a different thing. That is about taking a retrospective look at war and trying to figure out what does all of this mean? What can we learn? What can we define in regards to this subject 150 years later? And I couldn't even have begun to answer that question six years ago. But really, with the help of, of my graduate students at Central Connecticut State University, I've got some pretty darn good answers uh, to those questions. And we have found out things that really we hadn't even thought to necessarily ask at the outset. So I came into this Civil War commemoration, uh, I, I really backed into it. 
Uh, and then I grabbed a whole bunch of my friends at various places like here at the old state house. Uh, Sally Whipple, who's the executive director here, is one of the first people I called and said, hey, let's get together and talk about what we could possibly do for a commemoration. She dragged Diane Smith into it. We dragged Elizabeth Norman, who's here, who's the, uh, the publisher of Connecticut Explored, which is a wonderful magazine. If you don't get it, you should somehow be punished by the attorney general. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, well, maybe not, we won't go that far, but, uh, and we all got together and just started talking. And what can we do to commemorate this war and learn more about it? And, uh, you know, a few months later, we had 100 organizations at the table, everybody working collaboratively together. Uh, we got Connecticut Humanities, uh, which is, you know, the humanities agency in this state. Uh, to help us with some of the funding. They're funding these types of programs. They're doing and have been doing exactly what they should be doing in regards to these types of things. And we all just sort of have gone on this journey together. And where that has led is um, with, with working with my graduate students and asking these questions about the Civil War. I, have, I teach a, a class at CCSU called the Professional Historian. And one of the things I've always had students do is work on some aspect of Connecticut's history uh, and do primary research on it and write whatever they want. It, it didn't matter to me what the subject was. It didn't matter to me what the chronology was. It mattered to me that the sources here in Connecticut were available to them, especially the sources at the Connecticut Historical Society and our State Library and Archives. And over the years, I have had some absolutely astounding papers uh, produced in this class, many of which have been published uh, by, by various journals, Connecticut History, which is a wonderful journal here, here in the state. And so I decided with the Civil War commemoration coming, I thought, well, what would happen if I took this course and instead of having each of the students write on whatever subject they wanted in relation to Connecticut, what if I had them all work on Connecticut in the Civil War and let them do whatever they wanted as long as they were all working on a common topic. And, you know, I went into this not really knowing what they might come up with, uh, knowing what was out there and what wasn't out there on the subject of Connecticut and the Civil War. The last book that had been published on the subject was in 1965 by an historian named John Niven. It was uh, called Connecticut for the Union. It was produced at the very end of the centennial commemoration of the Civil War. And I would like to note that our commission had the good foresight to publish our first general history of Connecticut in the Civil War at the beginning of the commemoration as opposed to at the end, which I think has worked out pretty well. Uh, and so these students who started working on this, uh, one of whom you'll meet uh, today, uh, Jim Brown was one of the students in this original class, and he when we started talking about what would you like to work on, he said, you know, I'm really fascinated by finance and economics. I'd like to know how Connecticut and the nation went about paying for the war. How did they go about funding this huge war effort? And so he dug in and did this completely original research. He presented uh, some of this work in an Association for the Study of Connecticut History Conference uh, a few years ago. And one of the people who was in the audience that day, I remember like it was yesterday, this is a guy, Dean Nelson, who is the, the director of uh, the, the Museum of Connecticut History at the State Library. This guy knows a tremendous amount about the Civil War. And I'll never forget him looking at Jim after he gave his presentation and saying, you know, I never even really thought about how they went about financing this war. And everybody there for the presentation was fascinated by what Jim came up with. And so this is what uh, this, these students did. They came up with these the things that interested them and then they dug into our archives and looked at them. Uh, one of the other uh, students, and they're you know, not, not a student anymore, she's done, uh, who worked on this project, Emily Gifford, who we'll hear from, she became fascinated with the idea of the, uh, the history of commemoration in regards to the war. So she looked at what was called Decoration Day, which became Memorial Day, which we all know today. It's not merely a day to have a good parade and a barbecue but rather it is about the memory of service in our nation. And so she studied that all the way through to the centennial, and she's really interested in Cold War history. And so she was able to look at the centennial commemoration through the lens of American Cold War ideology. Who would have thought of doing that? Uh, and how 
Cold War issues and issues of nationalism in the 1960s impacted how people wanted to go about commemorating the history of the Civil War. Again, it's not something I would have thought of. One of the students worked, uh, Mike Sturgis, who is a high school student, high school teacher, excuse me. Uh, he's daylighting as a high school student and a graduate student. Uh, he's a high school teacher, and he was fascinated with the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder. Did Civil War soldiers suffer from what we, today we know as PTSD? He started doing research. He understood that PTSD was something that was defined as a official, official disorder only in 1980. It was originally viewed as something that impacted only Vietnam veterans, even though historians knew that things like battle fatigue and shell shock existed going through World War II, World War I, through Korea. Uh, and he started digging in, and he found out that this was referred to as soldier's heart. Uh, during the Civil War, which I actually think is a better term because so, uh, PTSD sounds so, in some ways, so perfectly clinical when soldier's heart reveals the really devastating impact on not just the psyche but on the heart of these soldiers, of what they saw with this level of destruction. And I think what you have to remember is that America had been through wars prior to the Civil War but had never experienced anything like the Civil War. There are, the, the latest figures for deaths during the Civil War are 750,000 soldiers. This is six and a half million people in today's terms. If we had a war today that was reached those levels, we would understand why this history sticks with us so much. Look at the way that 9-11, our experience in 9-11 has shaped our nation for the 21st century and think about not to, you know, in any way, uh, you know, uh, belittle 9-11, but we're talking about 3,000 people killed in the attacks and another six to 7,000 killed in the wars afterwards. Uh, that doesn't reach a single day in a Civil War battle. Uh, the Battle of Antietam, September 17th, 1862, in a 12-hour period, 23,000 men are killed and wounded. Okay. That's the experience of the Civil War. That's what is so shocking and so traumatizing to this generation. This is why this history continues to carry through and echo through our society today. And so this book, um, as I said, I sort of backed into it, but each semester for the next few years, I had a different group of graduate students who would come into the university, and I gave them the same assignment. I wanted to see what else they would find, and what did they find out? They looked at things like uh, shipbuilding in Mystic, Connecticut. They looked at uh, the burning of the Colt Armory right down the road from here in uh, 1864. And one of the, I have to mention, one of the really funny things is I, I, I send out uh, emails to the Civil War listserv to let them know events that are going on. And I, I have a tendency to be a, a little crazy with my subject lines to try and get people's attention. And I wrote in one of the subject lines, Colt Factory burned to the ground. And I got an email from Jim, who works at Aetna, and he says, you know, I just ran to my window to see if I could see the smoke. So uh, it, my email worked. I made him look. And, but, you know, the Colt factory, it, it's, it's the largest producer of small arms in the American Civil War. By mid-1864, the Union is producing so much war material that there's actually a glut in the market. They're, they've produced, they've overproduced by 64. So the burning of the factory doesn't have any impact on the Union's ability to fight the war. But the impact it has is on the issue of loyalty and on concerns about conspiracy. Because what flies around in the newspapers for weeks and months after the Colt factory, half the Colt factory burns, they think it's a Confederate conspiracy. There have been reports in the New York Tribune and the Hartford Current and many other newspapers that Confederate secret organizations and conspirators are descending upon North America from uh, you know, the United States from Canada 
and that they are going to set fires in New York City, that they are going to set fires in other places. And so there is a, a level of war hysteria that goes on at this time. And it actually fits perfectly with what I had written about in my first book on Connecticut and the Civil War, and that was the level of war dissent that has exist, existed in the state of Connecticut. I mentioned John Niven's book, Connecticut for the Union, and his very title and most of the focus of the book lends to the idea that Connecticut was unified in fighting this war. And one of the things I've been getting trying to get the residents of Connecticut to understand is that nothing could be further from the truth, that Connecticut was deeply, deeply divided over this war to the extent that there were really quite serious concerns that Connecticut might not support, some in Connecticut might not support the war effort at all. The 1863 gubernatorial election be between William Buckingham, the sitting governor, and Thomas Seymour, who was running against him. Seymour was a peace Democrat. He was opposed to the war. He said repeatedly, if I am elected governor, Connecticut will no longer support this war. So when you think about that, and then you place the Colt factory burning within the context of those kinds of very real concerns, People really believed that this was a Confederate conspiracy. And, and the author of that chapter, Luke Boyd, does a fantastic job of going through it all and saying there was no conspiracy. But perception sometimes trumps reality, and this is a good example of this. Uh, what other kinds of, of titles do we have? I'm going to uh, read some of them to you. We have Untried to Unrivaled, the 14th Regiment, Connecticut Volunteer Infantry by David C.W. Batch. He looks at the history of the 14th Connecticut and shows that uh, it arrived at the Battle of Antietam this horrible day uh, with about two to three weeks of training. They barely knew how to fire their arms, and they're thrown into the single bloodiest day of the American Civil War. They then go to Fredericksburg, and they lead the charge at Fredericksburg, and again they get decimated. They then go to Chancellorsville, and again they get decimated. And then they finally arrive at Gettysburg, and they are on an absolutely key spot on the defensive wall at Gettysburg called the Angle, and they are victorious. They stop the Confederate tide coming across the field. Uh, three members of the regiment receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for capturing Confederate battle flags, and these guys are, as they are defeating the Confederates, they are shouting, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, Antietam, Chancellorsville, and these guys write in the aftermath, and they believe that Gettysburg is their comeuppance, it's their, their, their payback, their revenge. Uh, and the, this regiment, as I said, they go from untried to unrivaled. The 14th fights in more major battles and skirmishes than any other Connecticut regiment. Uh, and it's a, a fascinating story. Uh, we have other uh, articles, chapters in here. Patriotism and abolitionism in Civil War era Wyndham County. One of my former students, Carol Patterson Martineau, who spoke in, on some of the subject here at the Old State House a couple of years ago. She's now working on her doctoral degree at the University of Maine, Orono. Um, she got a, uh, a full fellowship to go to grad school for her doctoral program because they were impressed that she already had a book chapter coming out So in this book. So I'm thrilled about that. Uh, I still haven't seen my 10% from her fellowship stipend, but I'm working on it. Uh, she became fascinated. She can count back generations of her family having lived in Wyndham County. Uh, a, a great, 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 great grandfather who fought in the 18th Connecticut. And she became fascinated. Well, one of the arguments I put in my first book was that Connecticut was not an abolitionist state. We think it is, but it really wasn't. And she wants to go and investigate this for Wyndham County. And that's what she did. And what she ultimately came up with is what she describes as the Prudence Crandall effect. We know that Prudence Crandall had started to create this all-girls school for young black misses in, in the early 1830s, and the town of Canterbury shuts down the school, and it's a, it's a really horrible aspect of Connecticut's history. But what Carol does is she really, I think, quite effectively proves that Wyndham and the entire region, the county, is really mortified by what has happened in the early 1830s. And from that point on, 
they want to sort of resurrect their name and reputation. And as a result, the area becomes one of the hotbeds of abolitionism in the state of Connecticut. And so in some ways, Carol digs in further than I did on my study of abolitionism in Connecticut, and on some levels proves me wrong. Uh, that's what we want our, exactly what we want our graduate students to do, is show us, you know what, you weren't so quite correct about that. And I still think that there is a, a full-length book study that is waiting to be done on the history of abolitionism in the state of Connecticut. We have been focusing, we meaning historians, have been focusing much, much more heavily on the history of slavery, the history of race, the history of African Americans in the state of Connecticut. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Norman uh, and the Connecticut Explored team uh, came up, had just came out with Wesleyan University Press with a fantastic book called uh, African Americans, Connecticut, Connecticut, that's, I knew that. Connecticut, African Americans, Connecticut Explored, playing off of the magazine's title, but doing, I mean, it's not a definitive history there. I don't think there's any history that's definitive, but it's the most complete kind of overview of African American history in the state of Connecticut from colonial times up through the 20th century that has ever been done. And so we've got, I feel right now, like in Connecticut over the past few years, there has been this tremendous, I don't know if even resurgence is the right name, but there has been a building of real interest in the history of Connecticut on many, many levels. I know Don Rogers, one of my colleagues at CCSU, is working on a, a detailed bibliography and source uh, work on the progressive era in the state of Connecticut. It's an era that has really had no study. And I think all of this plays to exactly what I have always asked my students to do, that it doesn't matter what history you're interested in. It could be European history. It could be an, uh, some element of national history. It could be the Cold War. There is a Connecticut story within that. And one of the things that we should be doing as students, as scholars, as citizens of the state, is we should be going and investigating our national history through the lens of Connecticut. Connecticut has an awful lot to offer for this state's history. Being one of the original 13 colonies, one of the original 13 states, we help to define the way our US Constitution is written. The, the state could not have survived the American Revolution without the materials and supplies that we provide. They could not have survived the Civil War without the arms and armaments that we provide. Uh, we are a place of tremendous invention and innovation. And I think to some extent we've lost a little bit of this and we need to reclaim it and refocus it. And so I wanna see more of this in our schools as well. I wanna see our museums and our historical societies being viewed much more with the value um, that they do and should have. And so the more that we can focus on our national history through this Connecticut lens, there are remarkable stories to be told here. And I think that this book uh, is an example of that. I think that Elizabeth's book is an example of that. I think Don's work is an example of that. And so we've got, I feel like we've got a lot of people that are moving in a similar direction right now with their interest on st state history. And I would really like to see that, uh, that continue. So I think now we are gonna go to our, our panel discussion and I'll be happy to answer any questions and I want Emily and, and uh, Jim to have a chance to, to chat about their experience with this, okay? Thank you. So wherever. Thank you, Matt, and uh, as always, uh, we're happy to have you here, and I'm really enjoying reading all of the essays in the book. It's kind of cool when you can read a book with a bunch of essays, because you can just, if you only have half an hour, you can sit down and read one and put it down and pick it up again, and um, not like reading one continuous history where you just don't want to 
stop. Um, I, I do want to introduce you to two of the authors of the book. Um, I had a chance to meet them all at a signing at CCSU not too long ago, but let me introduce Emily Gifford. Emily has a BA from Trinity College, a Master of Arts in Religion from Yale Divinity School, and an MA in Modern U.S. History from the Connecticut Central, uh, Central Connecticut State University. In addition to her work on Inside Connecticut and the Civil War, she's contributed articles to Connecticut Explored, as well as the Encyclopedia of Politics of the American West. She has also presented papers at national conferences on topics ranging from the use of Protestant hymns as primary documents in the study of American history to how Hollywood melodramas reflect the role of American women in society. And also with us is Jim Brown. Jim is a corporate attorney, and this year, 2014, marks his 40th anniversary of his membership at the Connecticut Bar. He received a BA in economics from Holy Cross, a JD from the Yukon School of Law, and an MBA from the University of Hartford. After graduating from law school, Jim worked for three years as a staff attorney in the General Assembly's Office of Legislative Research, and for the following five years, he was general counsel to the Insurance Association of Connecticut. He then moved to Aetna, where, except for the time spent studying at CCSU, he has practiced corporate health care law for the past 32 years. So thank you, all three of you, for joining us. We can't forget that Emily is also a Jeopardy winner. Right? She is. That wasn't in her bio. It was not in her bio, but she, she was on Jeopardy, and she won a few. I, 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 I was on Jeopardy. It aired. Remember that big storm we had when it snowed in October and the power was out for like, that was when it aired. <laughs> so, uh, so, so if you religiously watch Jeopardy and you're like, and eh, yeah, not ringing a bell here, that's why. So, <laughs> mean, our went, loss. They went to the extent of knocking down all those trees just so they didn't have to show you on television, Emily? I, I, I tell you, I, I, I I am very deeply concerned for all of this equipment right now. <laughs> Our loss. Um, Emily, I'm going to start with you because um, Matt mentioned your interest in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And um, you weren't really all that enthusiastic about writing about the Civil War and researching the Civil War, were you? No, I had heard, as he described originally, that the professional historian, you get to write about whatever you want as long as it has to do with Connecticut history. And I was like, oh, yeah, civil defense evacuation plans, 1950s, 1960s, yes! And then I get this note at the beginning of the summer before, you know, three months before the class starts saying, you got to write about the Civil War. There was much wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> and so I spent the summer just trying to figure out how am I going to make this a little bit more relevant to my interests in the 20th century. And I thought, well, you know, this is because of the 150th anniversary. There must have been a bunch of stuff having to do with the 100th anniversary. So I marshaled up all these arguments. I had like, I don't know, points A through K on, on why I should be allowed to do this. So I think it was the first or second week of class as I came to Matt's office. And I said, I want to party like it's 1959. And he said, Two thumbs up. I think all the thumbs up, really. And he was like, that's awesome. Here, you should go to the state library. There's this, this, and the other. And you should read Trouble Commemoration by Robert Cook, which everybody who is interested in this should, because he really hits the Cold War angle very hard. And he writes about the national centennial commemoration. So I, I ended up getting a lot of support about that. And then that was my way of trying to make it about the 20th century. And mm -hmm. then I ended up having to go back and I say having to because at the time it felt like, oh gosh, I guess I better go back to mm -hmm. the earliest decoration days and work my way forward. And then it ended up being really, really fascinating to me, not just the 20th century parts. I didn't have to just skip ahead. And we're going to talk a little bit in more detail about the 50th and the 100th as well as the 150th. Um, Jim, your chapter explores guns and butter, uh, the issue of financing uh, the war-related expenses by the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that I loved was that the man who came to be known as the war governor, Governor Buckingham, yep. uh, the legislature apparently was not in session, so he couldn't get money from the legislature. So he started paying for Connecticut's portion of the war and, and arming the troops by taking out a loan, a personal right. loan from the bank. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, he was, a, he was quite a guy. Um, he was, at the time, um, some of you may know, that, and, and uh, w what if this were the case today, the governor was elected every year. And so uh, he, was, oh. he was first elected governor in uh, 1858 um, and then continuously through 1866. Um, with that you know, election process going through the war um, throughout all of those years. And he was, um, 
He was a businessman. He had um, previously uh, been in only in local politics. He was the mayor of Norwich for 16 years, I believe, before he ran for state office. Um, he had run a dry, uh, dry goods um, outfit, and he owned for many years uh, a, a rubber manufacturing company. Um, and he was uh, very close to Lincoln during the war. He was very supportive of the war. Um, and as you say, when the war first began in April, the legislature was not in session. And uh, it was just prior to when Lincoln made the first call for 75,000 soldiers with an allocation to each state. And he, um, he had some influence uh, in the sense that he was on the board of directors of the Thames Bank. Uh, and he went and he, and he took out a loan and, you know, with his personal guarantee on it. But within days, other banks came forward. Uh, this is again prior to when the legislature was back in session. And, um, and similarly made funds available. And immediately after that, towns uh, came up with funds. So notwithstanding the fact, as, as, uh, as Matt has said, that during this whole time, there was an undercurrent of why are we doing this? Um, right from the beginning, there was a lot of support. And um, financially, uh, Buckingham was the leader throughout. Mm -hmm. So Matt, um, what did the war eventually cost Connecticut in terms of treasure and troops? Uh, in terms of troops, uh, we send 55,000 men to war, and about 10% of them uh, perish during the war. In terms of financing, I'll, I'll ask Jim because he knows the subject way better than I do. Yeah, but Jim doesn't know it without this paper. <laughs> um, what I can tell you is that the, the, both at the national level and in Connecticut, it was just um, on a scale that had never been uh, experienced before. And the parallels uh, were, uh, were understandable uh, as well. Connecticut started off with a state budget in 1860 um, of about $200,000. And interestingly, the Connecticut budget at the time did not include schools because uh, schools were funded throughout that era by a school fund that was funded through uh, money that Connecticut had realized by selling public land to the, to the federal government. So um, the, the, the state budget did not include schools, was about $200,000. The next year, the budget was about a million and a half dollars. Mm. And it got progressively larger, uh, uh, primarily through borrowing, um, so that by the end of the war, um, we started the war with a, a, a cumulative debt of about uh, $50,000 and ended the war with a debt of about ten and a half million. Mm. And did the federal government eventually reimburse any of that? Yeah, th that's interesting too. Um, uh, not ten and a half million, um, but early in um, early in 1861, Congress passed a law that uh, would allow states to submit um, uh, invoices to be reimbursed for. Uh, expenditures that helped the federal government in, in the war. And early on, Connecticut got a, an IOU for $600,000. Um, the, the operation of that, uh, this was under Secretary Chase uh, in, in Treasury, and they, they got down to minutia in terms of validating invoices for specific expenditures, et cetera. But at the end of the day, uh, and, and actually long after the, the war was over, Connecticut got back a little under $2 million. Actually, it's interesting because um, they got back, you know, maybe 700,000 towards the end of the war, and then it kind of languished. And then um, there was a debate between Congress and the states over whether or not states could get reimbursed for interest on money that they had given. And finally, Congress said yes. And so uh, there was a gentleman who was a state's attorney in, in Connecticut, whose name is escaping me at the moment, who took it on a contingency. And so went and, <laughs> and uh, you know, made a claim. And we got back about a million, 800,000 or so. And he got about 20% of it. Sounds so. pretty good. Um, I'm going to lead into uh, Emily's um, 
investigation into Decoration Day by actually starting with a question for you, Matt. You mentioned at one time at one of the commission meetings or one of the events that I went to about the extraordinary number of Civil War monuments in this state. Yeah. Yeah, Connecticut is, uh, you literally can't drive very far in this state without passing a Civil War monument. Uh, there are, at the beginning of the commemoration, I would have told you definitively, there are 139 Civil War monuments in the state of Connecticut. Uh, that is a result of a very, very good study that was done a number of years ago uh, by a guy named David Ransom. Uh, but since then, we have come to find there are a few monuments that were missed. There are a few monuments that have been erected since then. And so we, we feel there's probably about 150 Civil War monuments throughout the state. They come in all shapes, sizes. Probably the most famous in this region, of course, is the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch. But our Capitol building is one of the things I've been trying to talk to people about and to understand. If you haven't been through Connecticut's Capitol building, uh, it is a shrine, quite literally a shrine to the American Civil War. The generation that uh, fought the Civil War is the generation that built that Capitol building, and they wanted it to be remembered as a memory to this conflict. And so both inside and out our cap outside of our Capitol building, there are tons and tons of Civil War monuments uh, and memorials and plaques. And uh, so that, that in itself is a very neat history. And one of the things I'm really quite proud of in regards to the commemoration is we worked very closely with the uh, Capitol Commission on uh, Preservation and Conservation and we got a, a very old Civil War soldier figure uh, that was, had been created by James Batterson uh, that is known as the Forlorn Soldier. We were able to create a movement to get that properly conserved. And this past sem September, we moved it into the Capitol building and had a, a really nice dedication for it. And so it's, again, like everything else, what we've been doing, not only have we been looking at this history and remembering what happened, but we've been actively trying to explore the history and to create our own history in the process, which I think has been pretty neat mm -hmm. and successful. And Emily, the reason I asked Matt that question was that clearly there was a lot of interest in commemorating the war because of the building of all these monuments. And yet by the time the 50th anniversary comes around, it's not such a big deal. Well, it was and it wasn't. I mean, there. Um when I looked at newspapers, the New York Times, and then of course the Connecticut newspapers, on, on the, the anniversary of the start of the Civil War, there's not much mention of it. There, there's no mention, basically, of it. Uh, but there were events that happened, and President Wilson spoke at, the, at Gettysburg for the 50th anniversary of that battle. And um, I think that possibly the reason that they didn't necessarily mark the start of the Civil War. Oh, 50 years ago, this whole war started was first off, it was still within living memory. So, you know, saying, oh, by the way, 50 years ago, this war started. Do you guys remember that war? Everybody remembered that war. And uh, it might have seemed kind of redundant to talk about it, but there were 50th uh, anniversary observances, like I said, at Gettysburg. It was a big national thing. There were. Um, instances of, of the blue and the gray coming together and having that battle in common even though they were on opposite sides and so on and so forth and that was part of a whole national unity that was that people were trying to forge out of that which continued on into the 100th anniversary mm -hmm. with varying degrees of success mm -hmm. and um, so th there was a lot of the observances and with the buildings of the memorial a lot of those were kind of not done on any particular schedule vis-a-vis -vis an anniversary. The pattern seemed to be the town would decide to build a memorial, they'd figure out how to fund the memorial, they'd commission it, when it was ready to be unveiled, they'd have a celebration for it. And so it would be more tied to whether or not they thought the weather was gonna be nice and when they had raised the money and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's the general pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking also of the, the shrine that the capital is to the Civil War is, of course, the battle flags mm -hmm. uh, on display there. And the uh, battle flags were carried from the armory to the specially built cases that are still there for them at the, at the Capitol on Battle Flag Day, which mm -hmm. was, I don't have my handy piece of paper. September 17, 1877. Oh, I was thinking 77, 79. And that was a big to-do. Huge, mm -hmm. and um, there is even a book that was compiled, it's about 177 pages. Maybe I'm just stuck on 77 as a number now. <laughs> anyway, uh, detailing all of the, the, the 
regimental veterans that participated, all of the different women's groups that participated, all the different cities and what the flags were and so on and so forth. And so that was a big deal. And that was, I think, again, that wasn't really a specific anniversary, was it? That was well, just- it was September 17th. So right. it was Antietam. Antietam. And a lot of anniversaries of, a lot of dedications for monuments were on September 17th. This is exactly the reason why when we did the Forlorn Soldier, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We did September 17th, yeah. and I was really pushing to make that September <laughs> 17th mark. And I was thinking in the back of my mind, if we don't make September 17th, I'm going to have to wait a year because I won it on <laughs> September 17th. And so, uh, yeah, but I think. It wasn't a nice round number, though. No, it wasn't a nice round number. It and was I, just, they yeah. had it ready, it was ready to roll. Yep. Let's get this thing in there. Yeah, I think so that's exactly the, that, right. That, that's the point I was trying to make, though. Yeah. Is they weren't going for like, oh, it's been 25 years, yeah. or oh, it's been 60, 70, uh -huh. whatever yeah. years. No, I think Emily is exactly right that the way that these monuments uh, th happen is they a town would commit would say, well, we want to do this, mm -hmm. and then they would spend 10 or 15 years trying to raise the funds, and if sometimes it happened quickly, more often than not, it, it, it took quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I studied specifically Middletown because that's where I live, and the mm -hmm. commute was easy to look at the records, uh, just to bring it down on an even more local level. And I think uh, Middletown ended up with, I think, four Civil War monuments in the end. Plus, of course, there are also the private monuments where people will put in their own, you know, um, family plots that, you know, so-and-so that served in the war or died in the war, mm -hmm. or maybe their, their remains were not repatriated, repatriated, reinstated to Connecticut, mm -hmm. and there's a cenotaph there for somebody who was buried on a distant battlefield. So there are those private remembrances as well as the civic ones. Mm -hmm. I'd like to invite anybody who has any questions or comments to uh, please raise your hand and Ron will come to you with the microphone. So um, if anybody wants to make a remark, just... <clears throat> Just to follow up on what you've been talking about, I've been so intrigued because I just assumed because the JERs were so big, and I assumed they were big in Connecticut, they were elsewhere. I'm surprised that they didn't take the lead on um, some of these anniversary celebrations. The, 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 the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR uh, forms throughout the North in the aftermath of the Civil War, and it becomes the big veteran organization of the Union Army becomes very, very uh, powerful in terms of politics and what we understand today of veterans' benefits for our soldiers, the GAR is the one who creates them. And they are very, very active in terms of commemoration of particular uh, memorials and dates and things like that. And when you go around and look at Civil War monuments throughout the state, uh, there are many, many different organizations that create monuments. Sometimes it's states. Sometimes it's private individuals, the way that Emily described. Sometimes uh, it's towns, uh, but many times it is, in fact, GAR uh, halls that actually fund their own monuments in particular towns. So yeah, you, I, you, your se sense of that, Karen, is exactly right. And, and Battle, Battle Flag Day, the actual parade, that was a GAR. That, that is a GAR And, and the book I mentioned, yeah. that the, that was assembled and published by the GAR. Right. So, so they, they definitely were... There yeah. was involvement there. Yeah, very yeah, active. Very, very active. Emily, let's uh, move ahead to, uh, we'll get to you in a second. Let's move ahead to the, the uh, centennial celebration, mm -hmm. or commemoration, I should say, excuse me, um, which is a national uh, movement. Um, I hadn't thought about looking at it through the Cold War lens. What I was looking at it through was the Civil Rights era mm -hmm. lens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little Boy, bit about that. Uh, on the national front, it was, to put it mildly, a cluster storm. and. Uh, it ended up being, they, they were trying so hard to push for this, this sense of, uh, it was about preserving the union and it wasn't about race and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, of course, uh, the civil rights movement is, is gathering a lot of steam. So uh, that was some of, some, some of those problems that completely plagued the National Commission. And Connecticut, from the very start, really mostly was focused, the Connecticut Centennial, Civil, Civil War Centennial Commission, uh, was very much focused on public education and having people go around, having a speaker's bureau, so people could go around and talk about various aspects of the Civil War throughout the state. They actually and published a pamphlet or a booklet uh, on yes, how towns uh, could commemorate the, Well, they published several pamphlets and uh -huh. some of them, and the first one they published was how your town can <laughs> celebrate the, not celebrate, again, commemorate, they stress that. It is commemoration, not celebration. And, and it, um, 
if you read this thing, and, and I didn't bring it with me today, but uh, it is, it is, it literally talks about selling history, selling Connecticut, and it talks about how war is so important for forging national character. And it reads like, uh, for those of you who watch Mad Men, it reads like Don Draper wrote this thing. <laughs> and uh, it's just this very nostalgic hard sell and, and very, very much about the subtext of the Cold War. You know, we must be strong and have faith in God That's against it. our enemies. And of course, That's that was kind of a Cold War trope, was always trotting out faith in God, because of course we all know the, the, the communists were a bunch of atheists. And um, one of the things that I thought was, was kind of funny was when they talked about how your town could commemorate the Civil War over a period of the, civil, the, the same four mm -hmm. years of Civil War. Uh, you should form a committee and you should you know, do this, that, and the other. The very first thing you should do was appoint a public relations director. <laughs> Before you did anything else, you needed to find somebody to get the word out. And, and it's just, again, I'm picturing you know, Don Draper and Pete Campbell and the gang going out there and, 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 and selling the Civil War like well, a Chevrolet. At one, point, at one point, didn't they say something like, Oh, don't, no, but don't be crass about it. Don't be crass. That's don't it. Be they, crass. it was, I was going to say, don't be cheesy. It, the word they was they crass. did say something like the, that. The word was crass. <laughs> Do not be crass. This is Connecticut. We're never cheesy or crass. Well, this is classy yeah, Connecticut. It, it, was, it was strictly a, I guess, uh, yeah. a, then it would have been martinis and deviled eggs better than wine and cheese. But um, the, I guess that was it. I don't know. But I love that. Don't be crass. Don't and be I'm crass. like, um, yeah. And, and I kind of was reading it. I was like, Boy, this is like one of those communistic four or five year plans. <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the one of the things that was interesting about that too at the time is that this prescription, which is pretty much what it was about how to do it, never said don't talk about slavery, don't talk about uh, about racism. Right. But they didn't. Nobody did. And when you go through the documents mm -hmm. uh, at the time back then yeah. in the fifties, and when you stop and think about it, it it you know it's disappointing, but it's somewhat understandable because um, I just happened to start reading this week, and I forget the author already, but uh, uh, It's Time Has Come, which mm -hmm. is a new book on, on the passage of the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. Mm -hmm. and, the, and you can see, as the, as the Kennedy brothers are talking to each other, uh, as momentum is building in, in 1963, uh, that they're, you know, the best way I could say it is they're being pulled into this. Mm -hmm politically, not so much with a charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you put that together with the fact that just a couple of years earlier, the commemoration of the Civil War was clean from the perspective of talking mm -hmm. about race and slavery, it sort of made sense mm -hmm. in, a, in a sad way. But I would like to interject one thing, and one thing that I found in another way that the Civil War was commemorated, at least, again, because I focused on on the very local level in Middletown was at state, uh, city rather, anniversaries. And the uh, tercentenary of Middletown, the 300th anniversary was in the 1950s. And Woodrow Wilson High School put on a series of 12 tableaus about the history of Middletown. And they were these, you know, people would do these, enact these scenes while somebody read these, these sort of rhyming couplets about various aspects. And one of those 12 was about slavery. And it was a very, very frank acknowledgement about mm -hmm. Middletown's shameful participation in this dreadful chapter in America, very, very frank acknowledgement of that for the 1950s, I thought. And uh, of course, by the time they get to Civil War, then it's all about, you know, we're preserving the Union. Mm -hmm. Although they also acknowledged that there was division within Middletown. But that was one of those mm -hmm. kind of things that it brought me up short, because I was very surprised to see that in a high school pageant mm -hmm. being addressed quite as frankly as it was. And that is another thing that I found was that a lot of Civil War commemoration took place as civic events when people were marking milestones in their own towns. Mm -hmm. that, uh, like the 300th anniversary yeah. of Middletown, they're going to talk about what's gone on during those 300 years. And one of those things was mm -hmm. the Civil War. I so that was a question right over here. Uh, th this is a question for Jim. Uh, when we uh, think about the politics of Connecticut during the Civil War, a lot of focus goes on to the uh, gubernatorial elections. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering about the legislature um, and uh, uh, what was the, comp the attitude of the legislature toward funding the Civil War? Mm -hmm. uh, did Buckingham have opposition to deal with in the legislature, especially in light of the fact, as we know, is the legislature then was pretty malapportioned, very much over-representing rural areas rather than the cities? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A great question, Don. Um, Yes, he did have opposition, but the Republicans uh, were in a majority of the House and Senate, uh, 
um, throughout the war. And so, you know, as the Republican governor, he did have a, uh, you know, he did have the ear that way. But there was uh, a group of Democrats led uh, by uh, William Eaton. Uh, Democrats were, de Democrats were, were basically divided informally into peace Democrats and war Democrats. And the peace Democrats of which Eaton and uh, Thomas Seymour were a representative were uh, of a mind that, um, you know, we shouldn't be doing this, that the, 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 the southern states have the constitutional right to secede, that slavery is actually good for the economy in Connecticut, uh, et cetera. And so there was that undercurrent. Uh, now, once things got, and the, and the war Democrats were um, supportive of the war effort and of the funding, but at the same time were not reticent at all about objecting to certain specific policies like the Emancipation Proclamation or the draft or certain other things. Um, and then, not on a partisan basis, but more on a public policy basis, there were debates, as there are today, about whether or not we should uh, be funding this with current monies by taxing or by looking to future generations and, and, and bond it. And there were some politics involved there, too. First of all, they, uh, they borrowed money heavily in the first instance, thinking this war is not going to last very long. And, uh, and they also were looking for support for the union effort. And they didn't think that support would be coming if you were taxing corporations and, and others, et cetera. So it's interesting, throughout the entire war, um, uh, at, at the state level, there were, um, um, after, and, and, and at the federal level too, there were I increasing uh, taxes at the state level, but the percentage of revenue that came from taxes was very small. And at the federal level, they adopted an income tax for the first time, as you may know. Uh, they adopted a number of other, uh, a property tax, um, uh, but in, in Connecticut, a property tax from, from the towns coming up. But the income tax um, generally didn't provide any income until the third or fourth year of the war. Um, and uh, believe it or not, the, 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 the government's the federal government's initial source of funds and the heaviest source of funds, aside from borrowing during the war, were, were tariffs. Were, matter of fact, before the war started at the federal level, the only source of revenue were tariffs on foreign sales and revenue from the sale of public lands, which is, at the, at the federal level, one of the reasons why um, historians will say the only way the Union would, uh, would win this war is if it lasted long enough for them to establish an infrastructure for, for them to get, to, to get into it. Uh, because there were, I mean, at the beginning of the war, uh, the federal government, by law, could not keep money in banks. They couldn't deal with banks. They were dealing in specie only, gold and silver. Um, they, uh, there was no uh, banking system. There was no federal banking system. There were 2,000 banks around the country. There were 7,000 different um, types of currency. People got concerned about, um, uh, they stopped uh, doing business just in gold and silver uh, and, and, and started with leaguer tender, the greenbacks. And people got so uh, upset about the lack of gold and silver, they started hoarding coins. And so there was a period of time in, in 1861, 1862, even in Connecticut, where people were cutting up dollar bills and using them. And it was accepted as, uh, as a form of currency. And then after that, Frac and then they had fractional, then they, they formally had fractional currency. Um, so he had support uh, in Connecticut, but there was this political undercurrent the entire time from uh, William Eaton and the Democratic side. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on the financing was that throughout this time, even though they, they borrowed so much money, ten and a half million dollars during the war, the, the, the state's economy was growing and the, uh, the grand list was growing. And so they rationalized it by saying that uh, at, at the end of the war, um, the, grand, the, the total debt that Connecticut had was only a fraction, you know, it was like three or four percent of the grand list. So they'd be able to take care of it. And they did take care of it um, in ensuing years. I think I saw another question in the back there. In terms of the state, had you said I think fifty thousand people that were that had enlisted, 
Was there a large number of people enlisting voluntarily, or were they pushed, or were they, uh, they didn't have the work on the farms? Do you think a lot of them enlisted because uh, they were sympathetic with their, uh, their black brothers right. down it's, south? It's, it's 55,000 men who serve in uh, Connecticut units, and these are 29 infantry units, uh, cavalry units, light and heavy artillery units. Uh, the vast, vast majority, over 90% of them, are volunteers. They are not, uh, a draft goes into effect in 1863, but the draft is tremendously, tremendously ineffective. Uh, maybe seven to eight percent of men who are drafted actually serve. The draft doesn't work. It's more of a, a, a form of coercion to get people to sign up. And it actually was in the interest of soldiers to sign up as opposed to be drafted because they got all kinds of bounty payments from not only their towns, but from the state and sometimes from the federal government as well. So the majority of people join up. Uh, not, they're not drafted. Why do they join up? It is not primarily to fight on behalf of black freedom. That, the, Wyndham County accepted, thank you. Uh, it is not primarily to fight on behalf of black freedom. Terrell has really, she has very strong evidence from the soldiers themselves, from letters they wrote yeah. and so on, supporting the idea that in Wyndham County at least, which is of course not a very heavily populated right. area, that it is, a lot of it is about patriotism and abolition as her article says, but then that is again, an exceptional case. Right, it is yeah. an exceptional. But, but the worth noting. But the patriotism half of it is extremely important. Right. Because what people in Connecticut are fighting for and what the majority of Northern soldiers are fighting for is they are fighting on behalf of the Union and on behalf of the idea of maintaining the, the, the concept of small r Republican government, of representative democracy. They believe in that. Lincoln says, we are the last best hope of earth. If we cannot be a people of the people, for the people, by the people, and we cannot maintain this government, what does the future hold for the idea of democracy? And so they are fighting on behalf of that concept of, in a, in a way, they're fighting on behalf of freedom but it's not on behalf of black freedom. They come to accept that idea as a means to win the war. It's a very different thing. There was, there, the, the largest expenditure, war expenditure that Connecticut had were these bounties that, yeah. that Matt is talking about. And there were, throughout the war, there were continuous uh, amendments to the law to enhance the bounties that were being paid. And particularly um, when uh, periodically Lincoln would call for X number of more thousands of troops and that would get allocated state by state, so Connecticut would have 20,000 troops, and each town would be allocated a certain number of people right. to get. And so there was, for a while, there was some competition among towns, yep. uh, and people would go from town to town to get the bounty. There was a $300 bounty at one point to get in. There also were expenditures for families of soldiers, yeah. like $10 a month during the course of the war, and it doesn't sound like much, but it was, cumulatively, it was the largest expense. Yeah. And, and then, when, after the draft came in, um, the, there was a formalized system where you could pay for a substitute. You know, you could pay, for, if I got drafted, I could pay for, I could pay you $300 for you to go for me. And then there were issues about, in that circumstance, where um, I would pay for you, I would pay you to go for me, and you may or may not show up. Or you may or may not uh, stay with the, with the program in terms of deserting, et cetera. Um, no, no salary for sure, and the amount of money that was involved could not possibly, you'd think, be an incentive to, to join. Um, but again, it was the largest expenditure that the legislature had. And at the time, $300 to join up, mm. that's a lot of money. That's a good bit more than any laborer is going to make in a year. Right. That's a lot of money. I just want to um, quickly go into the issue of PTSD or soldier's heart, as you called it, because um, we're still, uh, there was a very interesting hearing, I think you might have even testified, in the legislature this year that related to releasing documents. And Jim, I think that's something that you looked into. Yeah, well actually, uh, I, I, I helped Michael Sturgis, who uh, wrote the chapter in the book um, uh, on PTSD because he, he ran into a roadblock fairly early on. He, his research had showed that uh, he could identify certain individuals who had come back from the war, were listed on other public documents uh, in Connecticut as having been, for example, uh, 
uh, patients at uh, Fitch Home, which was one of the earliest home for soldiers the in the first country. soldiers home in the country. Uh, and then had, at some point had been transferred to then was called the Hospital for the Insane. Connecticut Hospital, hospital for, for the, the insane, insane, which is today called Connecticut Valley Hospital. Um, and uh, he was trying to draw this link and draw a story out about these particular soldiers to be able to show not only that they had have what we now would call PTSD, but how it could explain other aspects of their lives. So he somewhat naively went to uh, the Connecticut Valley Hospital and asked for the records and basically was rebuffed uh, and was told, first he, he was told that we don't have any records and these, pop, these people were probably weren't here. And he said, well, you know, the, you, this institution was started in 1868 and I know of at least 40 people uh, whose pension records from the federal government show that they were there and uh, you know that's all we're looking for. And um, long story short, they refused to give him the records. And so one thing you don't want to do is to ask uh, Matt Warshaw uh, to have an issue like that and think it's going to go away, right? <laughs> so uh, basically Matt and I went to the Freedom of Information Commission and um, and, and filed a claim against the Connecticut Valley Hospital, um, and um, we Which had a couple. Which is run by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services today, so we had to deal with right. With so basically, the state agency that that was that we were making our request of that was being rebuffed was the Department of, of Mental Health um, and Substance Abuse and Addiction Services and Addiction Services, um, and 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 they they um, you know it, it's kind of it was kind of sad because you know they are in charge of protecting these members, but they uh, initially rebuffed, they initially said these, these records are, are too complicated for you to get anything out of, um, and, and, and thirdly, that, uh, they, that these are protected by psychiatrist patient privilege, and, uh, and, and that shouldn't be allowed. So, you know, we filed, we filed a, uh, an appeal to the Freedom Information Commission, um, you know, we, uh, Michael and I and, and, and Matt uh, testified at the hearing. The department was represented by the Attorney General's office. Um, and, you know, we argued that, um, y you know, that, that this is bad public policy, that these, uh, these gentlemen had been dead for a century and a half, and if anything, there is a public interest uh, in this issue. Uh, and with respect to the issue of psychiatrist patient uh, privilege, we argued that, um, you know, from the statute, to, to be, there, there are no psychiatrists that are licensed as psychiatrists in Connecticut. You are licensed as a physician and you specialize in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So the real privilege they had was a privilege of physician-patient mm -hmm. privilege. And so communications between a patient and a physician are arguably privileged under a statute that was, that was adopted by the General Assembly in 1961. Uh, and we argued that that was not intended to apply retroactively. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately we argued that uh, in any event, it couldn't apply because Connecticut didn't uh, license physicians until 1893. And so in 1860 and 1868, then communications between somebody who was calling himself a doctor and a patient wouldn't have been privileged because there, were, there was no privilege. So initially, um, the, uh, the Freedom of Information Commission uh, agreed with us uh, whole, across the board and they said this is, it doesn't apply retroactively, et cetera, but then they had second thoughts about it because they were concerned that, and we had no intent of getting into this, but they were concerned that, um, that this would allow access to records, uh, you know, an invasion invasion of privacy right. from Vietnam, World War II, et cetera, et cetera. So they came back and they still agreed with us and they still said you, ha you can have access to these records, but it was factual. It was basically saying that the uh, Department of Health did not show that uh, these communications were between a psychiatrist and a patient and therefore the records can be released. But then there's two more aspects of this um, that are kind of interesting. Um, the books, e even before that ended, the books were coming over from, uh, uh, you know, a left-hand, right-hand problem from Connecticut Valley Hospital to the State Library. And then in 2011, which was about a year and a half later, um, sort of in the dead of night, as Matt says, towards the end of the session, the legislature, um, you know, blew up this exception, basically, and, and modified the law to say that there is a privilege and protection against, uh, for any, you know, attorney-client privilege, physician, uh, you know, social worker privilege, anything like that, 
whether it's established by legislation or a common law, which means in the old days by judicial decree. And so that, in one fell swoop, although we already had the books, said, um, you know, no more protection. Well, we had a window for the books from about May until October. So we had the summer to look at the books before they close them off to us again. And I think the really important thing for everybody to understand today is currently there is a House bill called 5124 that is in this session of the General Assembly. Uh, it just came out of the uh, Government Administration and Elections Committee. We, uh, I testified, uh, the State Librarian's Office testified, and what we're trying to do is change Connecticut's law so that 50 years after someone's death, these kinds of records can open up. Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services is completely opposed to this. They've argued a few different things, and I know we don't have a lot of time, and I can address each of their arguments. And what we've tried to do from the very beginning is sit down with them and talk about creating some sort of common sense legislation that will allow access, but also, you know, address their concerns over privacy. And they just haven't wanted to deal with us at all. Uh, out of this, this uh, bill that's coming out of this government elections, uh, administration elections committee, they just passed an amendment to the bill redacting all the names, saying, yeah, you can have the files 50 years after somebody's dead, but we're going to redact all the names, which makes the files absolutely and completely useless to us. Right. We can't do anything with And that's what happened to us when we first went to the yeah. Department of Health. They said, you can have these records, but you can't use the names. Well, you know, if I've got a file that says that Emily was a soldier in the war, and I'm trying to associate the, the, her file at Connecticut Valley Hospital with other files I may have about her family, et cetera, if I don't know who she is, you can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. One other piece to this that, that uh, the professor probably would have mentioned in a moment is that, uh, is that uh, Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level a year and a half ago, a little over a year and a half ago, uh, amended HIPAA regulations using this exactly 50, the 50 we year proposed the 50, 50 years year. prior to death and it just yeah. makes sense yeah. and and one of the reasons why when Michael Sturgis was getting into this research initially why he knew there might be some stuff there is because he had found a book by a, a lawyer who happened to be from Connecticut um, but was done in uh, Indiana Right. Same kind of deal where he was finding records and he had access, he had full access. There were no to restrictions in Indiana state law. Right, they would go back 75 so, years, yeah. 75 years prior yeah. to the death. It's, it's just the whole issue is amazing and especially in regards to what the government and especially the military has been studying and learning about post-traumatic stress disorder and combat fatigue among Iraq and Afghanistan soldiers. They're the group. And I know because I've talked to quite a number of, of, of soldiers, as, as well as to the Connecticut State Army Surgeon General, who's a colonel in the Connecticut National Guard and a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. um, he has said, you have no idea how important this research is to current veterans. Mm -hmm. And to be able to show this trajectory of what happens in, in combat. And, you know, uh, I hope... Commissioner Raymer is, is watching this program. I would love to be able to sit down at the table with her and, and come to a con common sense approach to this because right now there's, it, it, that's not happening and we need to see these records. I'm sorry that we're gonna have to wrap this up but uh, we're over our uh, one hour time limit but Matt, I just wanted to ask you something about, I questioned your uh, naming your talk, how remembering the past changes it and I think what I was thinking was, well, the facts are still the facts, aren't they? So, And this is the big thing that people need to understand about history is, yes, the facts are the facts, but how different generations interpret facts, how the centennial commemoration generation looked at the history of the Civil War with civil rights, Cold War, the lens through which they looked at the Civil War is very different from the lens that we look at it through there. And that lens causes us to look for different evidence and different facts. So the facts may remain the same, but our understanding of them hopefully, hopefully evolves over time so that we look at them with a more holistic view, with a, a, perhaps a sharper focus. And one of the ways I've always described it is, in order to understand race in America, you study it and look at it one way prior to the civil rights era. You study and look at it a completely different way after the 1960s and 70s. And it's quite literally like taking 
a new pair of glasses with a new prescription and putting them on and go, wow, I never quite saw this clearly before. That, that's the answer to it. Well, thank you so much, all three of you, for being with us. We are going to have a book signing right across the hall in our gift shop. So if anybody would like to get a copy of this terrific book, I would encourage you to do that. Thank you all so much for coming today and being with us at the Old State House. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you.